can keep calling in, but we take you back up to uh, Capitol Hill. Frank Lucas is a congressman from Oklahoma, a Republican. He's also the ranking member of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Uh, congressman, I, I know you were listening in on that last call. Uh, the viewer ending his call saying, I don't know what's the hurry uh, to, uh, to get back to the moon and, and to Mars. How would you answer that question? First off, John, it's good to be with you. And I would note on this anniversary of Apollo, I think if we go back and pull the records, there was the same debate going on in the early 1960s. Was it worth spending all that money to develop Mercury and then Gemini and Apollo and onto the moon and the things that went afterwards? I would say it was the right thing we did 50 years ago, culminating in that landing on the moon. And I would suggest our future is both here on planet Earth and out there too. So. We should work in both directions at once. And how do we go about doing that from, from your perch there as the, the top Republican on the Science, Space and Technology Committee? What are your priorities? Well, we have to come to a consensus that it's worth going to Mars and we have to be willing to spend the resources to get back to the moon, develop the techniques that will enable us to get to Mars to move forward. Right now, that's the debate in Congress. Is it worth doing? Are there folks who are concerned because this came from the Trump administration? Are there folks who just simply believe we should stay on planet Earth uh, for eternity? I would say, like in the late 1950s and early 60s, we need to move forward. We need to make the budgetary commitments. And by the way, John, our competitors around the world are doing this very thing. The Chinese lander on the back side of the moon, the satellites in orbit around the moon to communicate with Earth, their public uh, statements in their press about a manned full-time base in a decade. If we don't go, our friends are going to leave us quite literally in the dust. In terms of the budgetary commitments, is $21.5 uh, $21 billion the right amount? I suspect that if we really want to get uh, to back to the moon by 2024. If we want to move on to Mars, we're going to have to spend what it takes. Go back again and look at the late 50s and early 1960s when Lyndon Johnson was vice president, when the National Space Council was driving aggressively, when President Kennedy was laying out a big, bold agenda. Uh, we have to make that kind of a commitment. Now, that said, there's all sorts of matters going on distracting people, but there were all sorts of matters going on in the 1960s, too. I would say we're spending at the very least the minimum of what we need to spend, and if we're going to get there and get there ahead of our competitors, we may have to spend more, and that number will evolve as the process goes forward. You seem to hint at this a, a minute ago, but is space travel a political, politically divisive issue today? Well, let's be honest. We would not have gone to the moon if the Russians hadn't put Sputnik up first if they hadn't sent a dog into orbit first, if they hadn't put the first cosmonaut in orbit around the Earth first. Uh, I would say that that Chinese lander on the backside of the moon was our Sputnik, our wake-up call. The problem is we're just a little more distracted these days, but the issue's still there. It's still important we do it, and we, we drive this great civilization forward. Because after all, NASA's a civilian agency. Our chief competitor, is run by the People's Liberation Army. That's a military organization. They don't do things just for fun. That last caller before you came on uh, said our, our next frontier is here. Can you talk about where you prioritize the use of, of space to monitor the Earth and, and the Earth's environment to sort of go up there to look back in? As you noted, John, I'm ranking member on the Science Committee, and our jurisdiction is NOAA, it's NASA, it's the National Science Foundation, amongst many other things. Weather forecasting, uh, our ability to gauge what's going on with the climate, both short-term weather and long-term, uh, now is key to all the resources that we have in orbit around the Earth. And looking out with all of our various telescopes and other non-manned or personed vehicles in orbit around the Earth gives us a feel for where the rest of the universe is going to. Uh, short answer is, if you care about what's happening on Earth, then we have to continue to drive forward. Where would we be now if President Eisenhower hadn't created the national uh, NASA? Where would we be if we had not gone to the moon? Where would we be if we'd not pushed all those technologies? I think we'd be dramatically worse off. Uh, when, the, when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, I had one TV option as a nine-year-old in rural western Oklahoma. Black and white television off a repeater tower, one option. Think about all the technology, all the things that have come from these investments. And that's just to get to the moon the first time. What about ultimately getting to Mars? Oh, it's just mind-boggling, John, the potential.
And finally, I know we've talked before about agricultural issues. They're near and dear to your heart as uh, the, the former chair of the, the Ag Committee. Uh, can you talk about the intersection of space policy and agriculture? Well, the technology we developed, the satellites we have now, not only check for drought conditions, they also have the ability to determine soil types. They have the ability to determine plant health, what kind of... Uh, pests are attacking plants, uh, what kind of conditions are going on. All this is a part of adding certainty to our capacity to produce. And it's not just production here at home, but we're watching crops around the entire world. That helps us better gauge the human food supply. Sometimes we think that groceries come from the grocery store. The fact of the matter is it's a farmer or rancher, whether it's in the United States or on the other side of the world, who raises that crop that is ultimately processed, that ultimately winds up on our plate. More information means more certainty of production, more certainty of supply, and yes, consumers get a safer, more cost-effective meal every time. And Congressman, in about uh, an hour and 20 minutes or so, we're going to be talking to your counterpart on the committee, uh, the chairwoman of the committee, Eddie Bernice Johnson. How's your relationship with her? Has the, the politics that we talked about uh, before that surrounds this issue, maybe more generally, uh, has it seeped into the committee? I have a wonderful working relationship with Chairwoman Johnson. Uh, I'm in, from Oklahoma. She's my neighbor down in Texas. I think we have a similar set of concerns and cares as to where the committee should go. She, of course, as chairman, is under pressure from her conference. She's under, she's under the scrutiny of her whole body. But I believe EBJ, as I like to affectionately call her, has the capacity and is a stepping up to do the right thing. And I intend to work with her to make sure the right thing gets done on the House uh, Science and Space and Technology Committee. You say under pressure, under pressure to do what? We are all in our roles uh, in the United States Congress subject to the influence of leadership, the constituents, the voters back home. It's a balancing act. We're not independent agents. We are a reflection of our constituents and we are a part of a team to make things happen. I just happen to be very focused on making sure we get back to Mars and that we drive the scientific achievements of this country forward. I think EBJ agrees with me, but she goes to a Democratic conference meeting, a Republican conference meeting, and we work out the differences on our committee to do the common good. Congressman Frank Lucas, Republican of Oklahoma.